Before I get started with this video, I just want to give a little disclaimer. Whenever you're dealing with German items from this period, there are going to be so many different manufacturers, variations, and exceptions to rules that it would be impossible to cover them all in one video. But in the description of this video, I'm going to include a selection of links. That way you can dive into even deeper detail on the particular bayonet that you have. This is a K98K bayonet, or more specifically, a third pattern M1884-98 bayonet. The origin of this bayonet can be traced all the way back to the late 1890s with the adoption of the M1884-98. After only a few years, this design was abandoned in favor of another, but it was reintroduced in 1915 as the second pattern M1884-98. Finally, as Germany began to rearm itself in the early 1930s, this bayonet was adopted for the last time in 1934 as the third pattern M1884-98. Now before we take an up-close look at my bayonet, I want to go over the changes to the ways manufacturers' markings were stamped over the years. When production first began in 1934, Germany was still trying to hide their rearmament from the rest of the world. Instead of stamping the name of the firm, they used what is called an S code. The S represented that the item was a small arm, and the three numbers after represented a specific manufacturer. The three numbers were assigned at random to every producer of the bayonets. Instead of having a year marking on the bayonet, a letter followed the S code and represented the year. This was done for only two years, with K representing 1934 and G 1935. In 1936, the letter suffix was abandoned, and the last two digits of the year were stamped on the spine of the blade. During 1937, the S codes were also abandoned, and the actual name of the firm was put on the Ricasso. For most firms, this continued until 1940, when the more well-known letter codes were adopted. Much like the S codes, these were issued at random and were used until the end of the war. Now let's take a closer look at some of the details of this bayonet. If we start at the pommel end of the bayonet, the first thing you'll notice are these two Waffenops. And those were basically military inspector's markings, and you're going to find those all over the bayonet. And we're going to take a look at some more once we take the grips off later. Now if we flip it over, here's our catch for holding it onto the rifle. You can also see a Waffenopt stamped on the button. Now moving down, here's our grips. These are made of a brown Bakelite. You will also see these made of wood, a hardwood, but the hardwood ones do not have these ribs rib texture in them. Now further on down, you can see this hole. This was used to vent excess gas that might get trapped up inside the bayonet, as well as allowing water to drain out when the bayonet was in its scabbard. Now on the back here, this is a flash guard. This is actually a separate piece that we'll remove later. And the early bayonets, the M1884-98 second version, did not have this, but it was added one year into production because they found that the muzzle flashes and blast from the rifle tended to damage the grip, so they added this piece here just to protect them. Here you can see that our grip is held on by two screws that go all the way through the handle and into these little washers on the end there. Now here's our serial number, 8786 with an X suffix. Now these would have originally started out in the beginning of the year at number one with no suffix. Once they got up to 9,999, they added a suffix, which would be A. Then each time that would repeat, they'd move down to the next letter. So that you can tell that this is from the towards the end of production for that year, and the year that this bayonet was made in was 1941. There's our three-letter code for EUF Horster. Now the blades on these bayonets were 10 inches long, and the entire blade would have originally been blued. Now if you look at my example, and it might be a little bit hard to tell because of the lighting, but it has some significant bluing loss. I'd say only about 40% of the bluing remains, but it is a very deep, dark, high quality bluing. And the blades themselves were finished very nicely early on, but as the war progressed, they put less time into grinding down the blades well and polishing them as well. So there were a lot more tool marks, and as such, the bluing also suffered as well. Now these were blued throughout the entire war with the exception of some at the end, but we'll discuss those a little bit later on in the video. Now let's unscrew these two little screws and take a look at some of the insides. Here are our grip scales. Now something you may notice if you're looking at a selection of these bayonets is that at some point the grips seem to change from this very dark brown Bakelite, almost wood colored, to a very reddish tinted Bakelite. And this was because in about Late 1943, early 1944, 
they had to stop using the very high quality early war resins and switch to uh, lesser quality substitute materials that gave it that red tint. You'll also notice in many of these you can actually see the filler material that was mixed in there with the resins. Now if you look on the back side of the grip scales you'll notice a lot of markings. And the first one is the serial number that was actually stamped into each scale. Now not all bayonets have this and these kind of extra markings were discontinued as the war went on. So if you have a later war bayonet don't expect to see that. Now here in the middle you can see another marking and that was basically just a kind of quality assurance mark for anything in Germany during this period that was made out of a resin or a Bakelite. But what that tells us about this scale is the manufacturer and the type of resin and filler material it has. So you see N9, that's the manufacturer, and I've got a uh, list that I'm going to link in the description, and that N9 stands for Karl Potoff, and then the Z3, which is the other marking, tells me that it's got phenolic resin with cellulose as a filler material. Now the last marking you'll see is yet another Waffenopt right at the top. And again, these Waffenopts, they put them on less markings as the war went on because the personnel that were in charge of that part of the manufacturing process, uh, putting these proof marks on everything, were gradually called away to go fight. So you'll see less of those as the war goes on. Now here we have the bayonet with the scales removed. And you can see the flash guard here, which is removable. But real quick, I want to point out, earlier in the video I said that this hole was used to allow gas and water to escape. Well, you might wonder how on earth does gas get in there, or how would there be a small possibility of gas getting in there? Well, that's because there is a channel that runs from where the locking lug meets all the way almost to the front. And that, and that is to accommodate the cleaning rod on the K98K. Now here is our flash guard. You can see it's just a simple blued folded sheet metal. You can see it is serialized right there. And there's not much else to it, just a little piece of folded blue sheet metal. Now you will find another Waffenopt, if it'll focus, right underneath where the flash guard sits. And you can see that this bayonet is the body of the bayonet is one piece, and then you have this little hand guard that has been pinned on there. You can kind of see the pins if you look at it at the right angle. One other thing I should point out while we have it all taken apart is that the pommel and the hand guard would have originally been blued, just like the blade, but these parts being exposed to the elements are very, very commonly found without their bluing. But if you look on the back side of the handguard where it's protected by the grip scales, you can kind of see the shadow of that original bluing right there. Now there are also some marks on the tang here. One right there, and then that. Those are just manufacturing stamps of some sort. No one really knows exactly what they stand for, but those aren't really that important. Now here is our scabbard, and this is constructed of just a very thin sheet steel. And you can see this would have also originally been completely blued, but the only place where bluing remains on it, on my example, is where the frog would have protected it from getting rusted off and worn away. These scabbards were serialized to the bayonets. You have the same manufacturer stamp and then a serial number. Now unfortunately, my scabbard does not match my bayonet, but you can see that is 8485, and mine is 8786, my bayonet. So they were only constructed a couple hundred, uh, the bayonet was only constructed couple hundred pieces after the scabbard was. So it's kind of strange how they still ended up together. Now the way I also know they would have been produced around the same time is because of the X suffix. They both have that X suffix and they both are manufactured by the same company in the same year. Now the last thing I want to show you on the scabbard is there is one Waffenopt on the little ball at the end and these scabbards are made of a very soft metal so it's pretty hard to actually see that there, but you can kind of make it out if you look at it just right. Now, the final thing we're going to take a look at is the leather frog. Now, there were three types of frogs, three main types of frogs that were issued with these bayonets. You have what is called the unmounted, which is what we have here. The mounted, which had a little strap that went around the kind of center of the belt loop. And then you had the tropical versions, which were constructed of a khaki canvas material. Now, those tropical versions are pretty rare and very expensive. It's, it's not uncommon for just the tropical frog to cost twice as much as a very nice condition fully matching bayonet. Now on the back of the frog, 
We do have some markings. It's kind of hard to make them out. I do see the year 1942, which is when this particular frog was produced. I will say one thing. This has had a rivet pop out and it has a contemporary repair with some thread. So when you're looking to buy a K98 bayonet, what should you look for? Well, the main thing you want to look for is matching serial numbers on both the blade and the scabbard. This obviously increases the value and tells you that this set has been together since the day it was manufactured. You're going to also want to make sure that the blade has not been sharpened. These bayonets were shipped from the factory with unsharpened blades. As you can see here, there's a flat edge, but you can easily tell that it's been sharpened by the loss of material along it and the sharp edge. And you can normally tell that from photos when you're looking at listings online. A couple of other features that will significantly increase the value is a 1945 production date. Supposedly there were only around 16,000 produced in 1945 by only two manufacturers because everybody else had been called away to produce other things by that point. You're going to want to also take a look at the amount of finish that is left on the blade. My example is not particularly valuable simply because the numbers don't match between the bayonet and scabbard and because there is a good bit of bluing loss. Finally, one last feature I'll tell you about is very, very late in the war. Some bayonets had riveted grips. Instead of screws, there would have just been two rivets, so you cannot remove the grips without destroying the rivets. Those examples are pretty rare and very valuable as well. Well, that's all I have for today. If you'd like some more detailed information about these bayonets, be sure to check out the links in the description of this video. Also, if you have any questions that you think I might help you with, leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you.